guests. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Southwick. I am the founder and executive director of Key Culture, as well as the secretary for the working group on sustainability at ICOM. It's a great pleasure to have you all with us today. Um, tomorrow, as I'm sure you are well aware of, is Earth Day. So we wanted to take this opportunity at the Working Group on Sustainability to celebrate Earth Day and to talk a little bit more about sustainability. And we have four incredible panelists joining us today. And uh, Professor George Okello Abungu from the Okello Abungu Heritage Consultants, Nairobi em and Emirates General Director and National Museums of Kenya. We have a Zahida Quadri, who's the Antiquities Department and Government of SIN and board member of ICOM Pakistan. We also have Helen Gutierrez, who's the project officer of La Ruta del Clima in San Jose, Costa Rica, and Francis Morris, director Tate Modern. So I'd like to start by telling you all a little bit about the ICOM Working Group on Sustainability and what we're doing, um, what we've been working on in the past couple of years and what we will be continuing to work on over the course of the next two years. And then of course, we'll be inviting our panelists to join us in uh, presenting their discussions on sustainability. And then we will have a panel discussion and finally open up for questions and answers. If anyone has any technical difficulties today, um, we always write the easiest thing, of course, is to try logging off and logging back on. 99% of the time that will fix the problem. Um, but if you are continuing to have problems, please post in the chat. Um, my colleague Alessandro is uh, going to be manning the chat so he can help with any unresolved issues. Um, if you have any questions at any point during the presentations, please feel free to go ahead and post them in the chat and then we will get to them at the end of the session. So today we wanted to talk about this issue of sustainability. And sustainability is a really interesting concept because it has many different meanings to different people in different parts of the world, which is why it's such a pleasure for us to have such a diverse representation on our panel today. So we'll be discussing what sustainability means and also what it means for culture. We're going to be looking at how culture can be advocates for sustainability and also take action itself. In 2019, the ICOM Working Group on Sustainability passed a resolution at the triennial uh, meeting in Kyoto on sustainability and Agenda 2030. Agenda 2030 is the United Nations formal declaration on sustainability, and it is the blueprint for a more sustainable future. It surrounds the five Ps, people, planet, peace, partnership, and prosperity. And underlying this agenda are the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which highlight 169 targets for achieving a sustainable future. In the resolution, ICOM has adapted the, or adopted the um, agenda 2030 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as essential and vital for museums to engage with. And this is what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, the ICOM Working Group on Sustainability has been working towards um, integrating the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the uh, Agenda 2030 into the work of ICOM and also to be able to um, uh, integrate it into the work of our institutions as museums. So what we'd like to do today is um, go around and talk to our panelists a little bit about their experiences. Um, I've asked each panelist to discuss a little bit about what sustainability means to them and also a little bit about what, um, what their work is, uh, has been related to sustainability in, in their uh, personal experiences. And I think one of the really important things about Earth day and about sustainability actually is to understand that sustainability affects all of us and therefore it requires a solution that includes all of us 
And one of the things that I'm really hoping we can highlight in today's session is uh, global partnerships as well as local cooperations and how community engagement and involvement can be a hugely powerful tool for our institutions and also how we can create global collaborations to tackle this issue as a sector in a unified way. So without further ado, I would love to pass over to our first panelist, George, who will be discussing his work in sustainability. So George, if you don't mind, the floor is yours. Okay. First of all, let me, let me, let me thank you really profusely for uh, inviting us to have a chat about sustainability and the issues of culture or heritage or museums. I see that there's quite a bit of representation before some of these guys were removed, uh, including my brother is there. Maybe next time we invite my brother, Patrick Abungu, is much better than me, I think, in, in that area because he practices it uh, all the time. So maybe you should have his name and invite him next time, my follower. Now, uh, I was looking at the question of the, the sustainable development goals. And uh, I think that heritage, although culture or heritage is not specifically mentioned, and many people do grumble that it was not mentioned, that, that it should have its own space within the sustainable development goals. I think that the fact that it is not specifically mentioned allows it to permeate uh, all along the different goals, the 17 goals. And when I counted, I realized that you can actually directly or indirectly apply museum work and heritage work and culture work to 11 of the sustainable goals. Whether you are talking of goal number one on poverty, no poverty, or zero hunger, or health and well being, quality education, gender equality, uh, number 10, reduction of inequality sustainable cities and communities, uh, responsible consumption and production, uh, climate action, or peace and justice with strong institutions, or just partnerships, which you have mentioned in your last, in your concluding remarks, they all apply directly and they require uh, our cultural uh, norms to, 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 to intervene. Now, taking museum, for example, and we'll come back to these issues later. There are a number of terminologies that museums do carry, sometimes not at the same time, but we aspire for them. Things like relevance. We can only be sustainable if we are relevant to the communities in which we serve. Whether we are providing education, whether we are advising on issues of landscapes or environment or climate, relevance for me is crucial. And I think that museums always strive to be relevant. The other thing is inclusivity. Museums try to be inclusive of all voices, irrespective of how different they are. And I think it is through those voices, through those democratic voices, that we are then able to discuss issues like gender equality, things that reduction of inequality. Those are key uh, sustainable goals that are actually we are looking forward to looking at. Whether you're discussing peace and justice, the issue of inclusivity is absolutely paramount. Also the issue of awareness. Museums are always out to create awareness either through education, through communication, through advocacy. So awareness and advocacy for me are crucial in sustainability. At, at, at people who are aware of their well-being, at people who are aware of their needs, at people who are aware of their climate, at people who are aware of their environment, are at people who are able to treat it in a better way so that it can be sustainable. Then the question of partnerships and benefits. I think we always strive in the culture sector to create benefits. Whether we are talking, dealing with artists, 
in terms of music, or we are dealing with artists in terms of art, uh, and maybe uh, Francis will agree with me in the, in the case of that. You know, it, 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 it's benefits. It is how do you how do you create benefits out of the entity? And without benefit, there can be no sustainability. So I think this is something that is incorporated in the museum language. Museums are also known for their education. And in this particular area, which is basically quality education is sustainable development goal number four in the SDG, quality education. I think museums complement the formal education by bringing in students, children, the grown-ups, the communities, and they do that. And so for me, they are directly complement the area of education and therefore provision of quality education, which is number four in the agenda. The question of conservation, which also looks at urban renewal. And this is an area that I would like to come later because I have an experience with Africa and especially East Africa, where you have urban centers which are conserved and where communities are living and where conservation work is done and where there are revival and development of the culture. And this culture then is transformed is into an economic uh, affair, which then benefits the community, either through tourism or direct buying from communities because they need these things. So when we are talking about, uh, uh, let me say, agenda number, number 11, which is sustainable cities and communities, I think that conservation that museums promote is part of this uh, sustainability that we are talking about. So for me and for uh, coming from this particular area, conservation and urban renewal is part of that. Then there is the issue of dissemination, disseminating knowledge, disseminating information, disseminating information to create awareness, which is part of the museum. Then there is the element of transformation for us to be able to be sustainable, we must transform ourselves and sometimes our actions. If we are not doing the right thing, particularly for environment, museums are always the spaces where we discuss these things, where we carry out exhibitions, where we can learn to do better, where we can actually exhibit environmental information, where we actually have groups of environmental groups, young groups, to try to promote that. So I see dissemination and transformation as very important. The other one is impact. The impact that we make on communities through our actions, through our exhibitions, through our educational programs, through our awareness creation programs, and through many other programs that we do on culture are absolutely crucial in terms of sustainability. And so we fit in perfectly there. There is also the element of transparency. We are talking about good governance. There is no better place of dialogue and discussion than a museum. There is no better place to exhibit issues of governance, to exhibit issues of gender equality, to deal with matters that you cannot be able to speak outside there that you can only speak through exhibition, that touches people in their heart when they see it. So the museums and culture becomes crucial in that. And so governance through transparency is absolutely important. And lastly for me in this area is the issue of the future. How do museums think about future? Because when you look about the whole issue of sustainable development, it is about now and the future. Do what is right now so that you can leave this world a better place for the future. And I think that museum should be projecting much more on the future, just as they project on the present. So the word future for me is absolutely important. And so for me, out of the 17 sustainable goals of the UN, 11 of them are directly or indirectly impacted by the work that we do in culture, the work that we do in museums. And so museums should not be 
sitting aside and waiting. For example, let me, let me take the case of the coronavirus. All you hear now is how many museums are suffering, how many uh, you know, staff are being laid out, how many museums are collapsing. We would like to hear how many museums are in the front line discussing culture as part of the solution of the problem. Not just looking at economics and health issues, but culture as one of the drivers towards finding a solution for the pandemic that is actually turning the world side upside down. We should take that rightful place and be able to say that some of these things are cultural issues that you can only turn around using a cultural language. And there is no better place than a museum to be able to speak that language, to bring in the people. So rather than just mourning over the problems that we have and how many of us have got coronavirus and all that kind of stuff, we should actually be saying how many exhibitions we have placed on each of the museums that we have, whether they're 95 or 104, how many percentages have been able, have stood in the front line advocating for particular change in cultural norms, for in, including cultural activities, for being there to mellow and to, 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 to soothe the hearts of the people and communities who are suffering from this disease, from this pandemic. So that we are sitting there with everybody else. Because when we are alive and when we are playing that role, that for me is what sustainability is all about. And at the end of the day, the sustainable development goals, as you have correctly pointed out, looks at the issue of how we can actually take action in the area of climate change how we can in, you know, reduce issues of unemployment, how we can strengthen gender equality, and how we can create a peaceful society. You cannot tell me that culture and museums cannot play a role in those. And maybe later when we are discussing, we can then actually give specific examples. For example, I have some examples that I want to say where museums have played a role in actually generating job employment, in creating a market where artists are able to create resources, to create products, and we go outside in the market and stand outside there and sell their materials and sell their products through reviving of their own cultural products, which are, are, are in demand and which does not contravene any of the, the ethics of the museum, but instead promotes that. So to, 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 to conclude, I think that uh, from wherever part of the world we are, and in any case, the SDG uh, importance is because it, is, it applies both to the rich and the poor, to the north and to the south in an equal way. So wherever we are, I think sustainable development goals must apply equally. And each and every one of us must use the resources that we have, the institutions that we have, including cultural institutions like museums to promote those. And if we can play a role in promoting 11 of the 17, I think we would have done a great job. Next time, I think we may even go and promote the underwater living. Thank you very much. <laughs> Amazing, George. Thank you so much. That was an incredibly inspirational start to the conversation. And I particularly loved what you were saying about the relevance, but also the awareness and advocacy and how important it is for museums, because this is this is something that I also very strongly believe that, you know, culture has the capacity to connect people with issues on sustainability in a way that sometimes facts, figures, news outlets just miss. There's that, that emotional attachment. There's that empathy and understanding that you get when you're dealing with culture that really is imperative for, um, for basically making people care. And so it's really, 
a beautiful um, thought to to understand the uh, agency that we have as cultural professionals. And um, I also really loved how you highlighted the interconnectivity of all of these different assets and, and facets of, of sustainability. So I'm looking forward to discussing more in the, in the panel discussion. So thank you so much, George, for your, for your thoughts. Um, I'd love to turn over to Helen, if that's all right, to um, tell us a little bit about her work in Costa Rica. So Helen, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, well, thank you, uh, first off, for the invitation to come speak on this panel. I'm uh, really excited to be able to talk about and share some of the work that we've been doing um, with the organization that I work with. Um, so today, when I was preparing um, what I was going to talk about, um, I kind of did a little, a short little list of words that I generally associate with sustainability. Um, and there were two kind of overarching concepts that kept popping up for me. And one of them um, George mentioned, which is change. And the other one is for me is justice. Uh, so when I hear the word sustainability, um, mostly because of my background um, and the work that I currently do, which is um, almost all focused on climate, I tend to focus more on the environmental aspect of sustainability. Um, but of course, everything is connected. Um, so we can't talk about the environment without also talking about society, culture, politics, economy, health, and everything else that you can think of. Um, so, and as the sustainable development goals make very clear, a changing, uh, a cha achieving, sorry, sustainability um, also means addressing climate change. Um, so I think this is gonna be the aspect that I'm gonna focus on um, mostly throughout the rest of my talk. Um, so I think in general, there's a lot of ambiguity around the term sustainability. And often when you hear it in more popular narratives, um, a lot of what it's associated with is being uh, quote unquote eco-friendly or switching to more sustainable lifestyles, meaning um, people are making the switch in their consumption patterns to more environmentally friendly products and other kinds of behavioral changes like um, using less carbon intensive uh, transportation like biking and, and all of these things, um, which, which are often more focused on individual action, um, which in and of itself is not bad. But often this kind of narrative is embedded within privilege because this is the kind of lifestyle um, that's not necessarily accessible to everyone. Um, and I think one of the most stark examples of this kind of disparity is illustrated um, by the many Central American farmers uh, who lived off the land most of their lives and are now unable to do to continue doing so because if they do, they most likely won't survive. Um, so for a, a lot of these people, they're facing deep and systemic inequality, there are high rates of poverty and food insecurity, um, violence in a lot of Central American countries is a huge problem. And they're also facing the direct impacts of climate change. Um, so for them to be able to live sustainably as they used to has become unsustainable and many of them are forced to leave their homes permanently. Um, and Central America is also one of the regions that's most um, vulnerable to climate change, not only because of the existing social vulnerabilities, but also because the region um, geographically is more exposed to certain kinds of climate impacts. Um, and this is also a region that lacks um, a lot of the resources that are necessary to deal with these impacts. Um, and this is due to existing inequality and disparity. Um, and this is also a region that has uh, statistically contributed the least uh, to climate change um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So if you look at um, comparatively across the world, the regions or the countries that have contributed to climate change via um, greenhouse gas emissions, we're pretty low on the, on the list. Um, so when I say that I associate sustainability with justice and change, um, for me, that means that for a more sustainable world, we need justice for the people who have already been impacted by climate change, as well as other kinds of environmental uh, harm, um, as well as the resources to deal with current and future impacts. Um, we also need to dismantle the systems of oppression that makes it so that one group of individuals benefit from the oppression of others. Uh, we need ambitious, effective, and immediate climate action. And we need to ensure that those who have been most responsible to contributing to climate change are also held accountable. 
Um, and all of this is deeply tied to the notion of justice and the basic and the respect for the basic human right to live and to have health, to live a dignified life. Um, and to get there will require, um, as George said, deep and tran transformative change. Um, so I think the SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals are a really excellent step in the right direction. Um, but I think if we want to truly achieve a more just and equitable and sustainable world, I think we're gonna need solutions um, that are very creative and interdisciplinary um, and that perhaps go beyond what the SDGs currently call for. Um, and I think it's in this space that arts and culture play a really critical role in imagining what is possible and how we can collectively move towards meaningful change. Um, so climate change lies at the intersection of cultural and physical processes. And it's the social and economic and cultural constructs that really create the conditions that perpetuate the sustained emission of greenhouse gases and the lack of political action um, to kind of contain um, these actions. And so it's also these constructs that reproduce the systems of oppression that make some people feel the impacts of climate change more than others. Um, and understanding the cultural aspect of climate change and the role of culture as a discursive tool for maintaining the status quo is really fundamental. And I think it's in this context that art can be a really powerful tool um, that allows us to begin to question these constructs and helps us to better understand and situate ourselves within this world. Um, and also um, just kind of that art plays a really important role in upholding and transforming transforming, sorry, uh, dominant narratives. So I think um, it's a really powerful tool that we can harness um, in order to create change. Um, and so I've seen in many instances art used as a tool for social activism, as a tool for raising awareness about specific issues, and also for the preservation of ancestral cultural knowledge and practices, which is also really important if we're talking about sustainability. Um, and then on the other hand, I think it's important to acknowledge that the creative creative process itself of making art can also have a really profound effect over the people who create um, who create artwork and can also change the way that they situate themselves within the world. Um, but I think if you look at it, the kind of climate discourse more broadly, um, you'll really see that art and, and culture in general have been conspicuously absent from these conversations. Um, and the conversations around climate change in general tend to be really technical and heavily technocratic. Um, and so when you go to climate spaces, like for instance, um, the climate summit by, uh, from, by the United Nations um, or COP as it's commonly known, uh, what you'll hear a lot is um, voices from the physical sciences, sometimes voices from the social sciences, a lot of politics and almost no voices um, from the culture or humanity sector. Um, but climate change is an issue that affects us all. And so I think creating spaces that these other voices can also participate in is really key for achieving meaningful, meaningful change. Um, and so, well, some of the work that we do at La Ruta del Clima, um, actually all of it, is based on our human right to participate in climate governance and our right to have a say in the, in the decisions that are going to affect all of our lives. Um, and so we were kind of analyzing this, this disparity that we noticed in, within the, the climate sphere um, and the humanities. And we thought that it was a really um, unique opportunity to try to implement a project that might help to bridge this gap. Um, and so the project that we came up with is called, uh, in Spanish, Ilando Justicia Climática. And this translates very roughly to the act of stringing together climate justice. And the word ilar means, um, it refers to the act of spinning a raw substance such as cotton or silk into threads. Um, and so there was something that really spoke to us um, about this, this kind of analogy of taking something intangible and, and, and creating something a little bit more concrete. Um, and the project itself is the result of a collaborative effort between our organization, La Ruta del Clima, the Costa Rican Embroidery Club, the Costa Rican Jade Museum, and the Heinrich Boll Foundation. And our overall goal is to, is to create a space and, and nurture a space um, where we can talk about issues related to climate change and climate justice and, and learn about all of these things 
while also using um, embroidery arts kind of as our chosen medium of expression. Um, and we also chose embroidery, um, not only because we're all really um, keen uh, embroiderers, but also because it's a, an art form that has been traditionally marginalized within the, the more formal art world. Um, and so in this project, we've created a virtual space, which we hope will become a real physical space in the future, um, pandemic allowing um, for people to come together and learn and talk about climate justice while at the same time embroidering. Um, and this format is modeled off one that's been used uh, for quite a while by the Costa Rican Embroidery Club, where people come together um, to embroider and just chat in general about different topics. Um, and so, so far we've hosted two virtual meetups um, and shared two open access embroidery designs. And in the first uh, meeting, we, we talked generally about climate change and what it is. Um, and then the second one, we, uh, do, we dug a little deeper about what climate justice means and, and how that's linked to feminism. Um, and then in the following meetups, um, we're gonna have two more. We're gonna be talking about uh, participation and empowerment uh, about climate change. And the last one will be focused more specifically on climate. Sorry. I have a dog. <laughs> um, and the last one will be focused more specifically on climate impacts. Um, and so aside from our, our virtual meetings, um, we're also sharing content and information on social media to complement this conversations that we've been having. Um, and in fact, uh, next week, we'll be highlighting a few Latin American embroidery artists um, where we hope to start a conversation about the different ways that embroidery art can be, and textile arts more generally, can be used um, as a powerful tool for environmental activism. And then to finish our, our learning process, we're going to be embroidering a, a collective piece, hopefully um, if the conditions allow, um, that summarizes everything that we've been learning and discussing um, during our conversations and then hopefully taking it to COP26, which is going to be held in Glasgow, um, and hopefully foster a conversation that's a little more rich in diverse perspectives on climate justice. And so I think um, just to close, I wanted to mention that um, our partnership with the Jade Museum has really enriched our project not just because it's provided us with some of the spaces um, to hold our activities, but also because of the visibility that they've given our project. Um, and I'd also like to point out that um, the idea of bringing together embroidery and climate change is a bit of a crazy idea and not necessarily one that's more accepted in traditional uh, spaces. Um, so I think one of the things that we're most grateful to the museum is in validating and legitimizing our project by becoming our official collaborators and providing an alternative space to hold such, such an important conversation. Um, so I think I'm gonna close with that and sorry about the dog. Oh, not a problem. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Helen. I, it's so exciting to hear about um, the projects that you're working on. And I think what really resonated with me was, you know, while maybe embroidery for some might be a non-traditional way to talk about climate change, that's that's part of the 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 issue that we're that we're discussing today is the different approaches and different languages with which people can understand issues related to sustainability and that's of course the power of culture is that we can communicate with people in different ways as you pointed out a lot of times especially climate discussions are very limited to scientific jargon and I mean, when I first got into this nexus of sustainability and culture and would be talking with a climate scientist or even a sustainability engineer, and they start throwing out, you know, KWH and EUI and all of these acronyms at me and, you know, megatons of carbon dioxide, and it, it was didn't really mean much. And so if we can find ways as cultural institutions and as cultural professionals to connect with people in a way that fosters that comprehension, that understanding, that is what it's all about. And expressing expressing climate in different languages is, is a really beautiful thing. So I'm really excited to, to learn more about the project and thank you so much for sharing.
Um, so it, lo it looks like we have Zahida back. So I would love to pass over to Zahida to finish her presentation. So um, Zahida, are you with us? Yes, I am. And I'm really sorry for the inconvenience that uh, occurred due to my connection uh, unscapability. It is not sustainable. So I think that was the problem. <laughs> Absolutely no worries. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I was talking about the potential that Pakistan has uh, regarding harnessing, uh, harnessing heritage and its museums to address global challenges. Um, and I was quoting one of the example, uh, in fact, a project that government was uh, initiated in 2019, uh, the Million Tree uh, the, uh, Tsunami pro Program. Uh, and it will really get uh, a very good feedback from people uh, the commune, local community. Uh, the figure I was sharing uh, before my presentation uh, was cutting. Uh, 3.5 billion trees we have already planted, and we, uh, uh, you know, wanted to plant 3 billion more by the mid of uh, 2023. But uh, due to the COVID-19, uh, you know, we, the project was uh, uh, badly affected, and uh, we were waiting for resuming uh, all the again. So the best part of this project was the government has invested in a field which is very much underrepresented and underestimated. Like environment, culture, and heritage are few fields which got less attention in government pol government policies, considering the status of you know underdeveloped countries like Pakistan. But interestingly, this process has generated nurseries, which provide a livelihood to many. Uh, the program has generated tens of thousands of new employment opportunities. Like I would like to share a figure when it was started, the nursery stock we have is about 30 billion, uh, sorry, 30 million all over Pakistan. Uh, but like, later it has increased and become 300 million. And this is an uh, official uh, government statement of our federal minister of climate change. So see how a micro level, uh, uh, on a micro level, uh, it benefits to the community and uh, I hope so. If it is continue, we will hope it will increase more jobs and more avenues for community later on. So yes, the efforts have been, has been taken to meet uh, as much SDGs uh, as possible. Like uh, with this initiative, a try was to reach to, uh, or you may can say, you can say we have targeted one of the goal goal uh, 13 climate action. But uh, it, on the other hand, also covered goal number one, no poverty. And uh, along with it, it has also created an opportunity for decent work and economic growth due to the goal number eight. You know? So in this scenario, we are trying to establish a sustainable future, but unfortunately there are many hurdles due to which it takes time in implementations. So now if we bring museum in this context, um, uh, to be very honest, we are still far to relate as DGCs and museums. But a very uh, interesting uh, and a very important point uh, raised during a webinar, which ICOM Pakistan has organized uh, on International Museum Day last year, that uh, when our museum community is sadly struggling with pandemic shutdowns and loss of uh, revenues and facing crisis, selling their museum antiquities uh, to run their expenses and reduce the staff, museums in Pakistan were stable and sustainable. Uh, we did not face any issue of unemployment like I'm specifically talking about museum employees. Uh, in general, yes, we face unemployment, but uh, no museum employee was, uh, you know, uh, uh, un uh, I mean, you know, uh, lost his job just because of the pandemic. Because uh, our museum sector uh, here is under the supervision of government and they are funds allotted to them. So instead of uh, any such difficulties, uh, our museums were fortunate to looking forward for options how to facilitate their audience. Uh, for example, I was just supporting an example of the State Bank Museum of Pakistan uh, with one of its social media posts. They have posted some selected selfies and photos that visitors will have captured there. And uh, that post got uh, 200 views, which uh, for any museum organization in Pakistan is really a good number. So then uh, they have organized an exhibition uh, which document lockdown and pandemic. Uh, because uh, for, uh, you know, it's a kind of uh, phase that we have, we all were being through. It's an historical phase uh, that came in our life and still stay with us. So it has memories, maybe terrible or whatever, but it has memories. So similarly, uh, the National History Museum in Lahore, they've organized a virtual exhibition for their visitors. 
and they have launched their online uh, storytelling sessions uh, during lockdowns just to engage their audience with the uh, museums so like uh, uh, the um, this is how the museums are connected uh, uh, during lockdown and kind of um, uh, pandemic and all these things but uh, the another uh, point i would like to share here that our tourism policy which in the beginning of 2020 before pandemic uh, uh, it, it was like a, a boost of uh, the tourism industry in pakistan uh, pakistan got uh, maximum votes by travel adventure and uh, declare world uh, third highest potential adventure destination for the, uh, 2020 by british backpacker society and uh, later, uh, earlier, uh, a US travel magazine list Pakistan as a top tourist destination for 2020. Uh, so it was like, it was, we have a tourist places plus the tangible and intangible cultural heritage, which can connect uh, people from other part of the world to the Pakistan. If you come here, uh, you probably probably get a chance to meet with the Kailash people of the Hindu Kash, uh, which are the descendant of Alexander the Great. So the government has made heritage trail in Peshawar as well. And also now they are resuming the old railway track, which was once active at the time of British period and it's connected Peshawar, one city to another. So people were moving uh, toward the heritage sites, the museums, uh, and uh, it's uh, like uh, it's, a, uh, it's a trail between two cities. So in case of museum in Pakistan, it is very much uh, connected to heritage and tourism on the other hand. Yeah. And um, community here is need to engage with museum by creating events. Generally, a uh, museum is not very much attractive uh, for a local community until and unless museums dare self invite people to come uh, and uh, for an exhibition or for an event. And uh, yes, uh, when uh, when we uh, whenever we have organized such exhibitions or event on national level or even the provincial level. The response from community and local people was amazing. Uh, I would like to add one more thing. In 2019, uh, ICOM Pakistan has organized a week-long event, and it was the Women in Museum. You know, it's a theme of uh, ICOM, uh, Women in Museum. So we have organized a week-long event, uh, Women in Museum. And the participant uh, of uh, participations from female curators was uh, really amazing and groundbreaking because, um, interestingly, uh, uh, at the higher authorities here in Pakistan, they are kind of, you know, uh, male dominated society. So they do not uh, uh, give very much a good space for women to take a lead during, um, I mean, the workspace or <laughs> you, you understand. So, but you, during this week, um, uh, the, each and every event was organized by the women and attended by the women. So uh, I can say that during this uh, uh, Women in Museum Week, it totally changed the scenario in Pakistan entirely for, in all provinces. And that was one of the major projects of museum in Pakistan that took women in all museums in lead. So yes, um, um, still uh, there are many policies uh, related to climate change uh, or, or climate sustainability and heritage. Um, which uh, remained unimplemented um, and uh, still there is a need to find ways to better capture the complexity of uh, heritage generated impact. Um, but uh, that's how uh, we are moving toward the achieving our sustainable development goals through museums, heritage and tourism. So thank you so much. Amazing. Zahida, thank you so much. I'm incredibly inspired. I love the uh, the events you were talking about with the women in museums and it's just it's it's really moving to see what um what power and what em empowerment can be can be gained through through institutions and also through um events but also just um advocacy for these these types of these types of initiatives so i'm really excited to to learn more and thank you so much for sharing um i think another thing that uh that was really interesting that you were talking about was um museums uh, offering events in order to facilitate engagement and especially with local communities and how powerful that is. But I also find it really interesting talking about what uh, George was was discussing in his conversation about um, inviting people in and not just giving giving um, uh, outputs, but also getting inputs from from uh, communities. And I think this is something that we'll touch upon in the panel discussion. Um, but of course, I would love to, um, to, to discuss that after we hear from our last panelist. So it's with great pleasure. I'd love to turn the floor over now to Francis. 
Oh, Francis, you're still on mute. There Thank we are. You, Caitlin, it's, it's really lovely to be here. And it's always, it's good to be last because with a great panel like this, um, I find a, a lot of really important things have been said. And one of the striking um, aspects of this conversation today is that we are all part of this incredible ecosystem, which we call culture. And we all occupy incredibly different spaces within it, but we are all bound together and our fates are bound together. So it is incredibly important that we meet together and find a way to move forward, kind of in solidarity. Um, and you asked Caitlin for us to talk about what sustainability meant, means to each of us. And I think for me as director of Tate Modern, it's so much more than, you know, the kind of working towards carbon reduction, though of course that plays a part, but it kind of represents a, a code of conduct, um, acting within a kind of ethical and artistic framework. Uh, and economic framework that, that delivers a range of social and civic responsibilities to the public and can help change the world. And if we're going to uh, survive and thrive, um, we need a, a new set of structures and systems and beliefs uh, to create our code of conduct. I mean, all of us, all the museums, all of us in ICOM, we're a huge community and we come in uh, very different shapes and different sizes from, from very different places. And so I just thought, I, I don't want to spend, say too many general things because George George and Helen, you did that so brilliantly alongside Zahida and Helen's kind of micro stories of uh, engagement. But I thought I might just talk a little bit about Tate Modern as a case study. Of course, Tate Modern is a, a relatively new museum. Uh, we only date from 2000, so a very modern 21st century museum, but we're part of a much older museum founded in the late 19th century, which is absolutely part of that baggage of colonial uh, capitalist Europe, the foundations, not just of culture, but also of climate uh, emergency and, uh, and all the things that uh, mean that we need those sustainability uh, uh, goals. Um, we're a public institution with a civic person, a public mission, we're free to our public, but we only have 50% of our funding from public sources. So we have this uh, extraordinary and pro problematic business model where we have to balance that civic purpose, that kind of civil service mentality with a pretty uh, shrewd entrepreneurial um, uh, income generating model for ticketed programs. Uh, we're substantially dependent on commercial enterprise, both corporate and philanthropic. And like many museums, uh, it, at least in the Western world, we, we carry all those uh, paradoxes and internal contradictions with us while abiding by a, a governmental governance model. So it's a really interesting and challenging um, kind of organization that, that doesn't fit any single model. It is genuinely hybrid. Um, we have a long history of thinking about sustainability in terms of our building and our operations. And that's partly because we built several buildings in the last decade. So um, being a, a, an institution that is committed to creative endeavor and innovation, we've naturally uh, gravitated towards architectural and engineering practices who are interested in sustainability. But, um, and we have a team that's very committed to it. So a lot of the groundwork in terms of kind of just number crunching and, and reduction of emissions has been in place and growing since, since really the uh, early part of this century. But there was a huge paradigm shift for me as director of Tate Modern when in 2019, we made a kind of official declaration of climate and ecological emergency. And that meant like putting out a press release saying we recognized what was happening in the world. We were terrified by it. We want to be part of driving solutions and understanding the problem. And I think we did that because of a growing unease uh, amongst many of us uh, in the institution, uh, a sense that we needed a step change, but equally really big, bold pressure from artists in our community who look to places like the Tate as institutions that hold 
trust, are trusted by the public, that have high profiles, that, that we can provide a voice and leadership and advocacy. We can burn our bridges when, and we can shield artists from having to put themselves on the front line. So at that time in the UK, globally, there's a context of extinction rebellions, activism, and uh, as Tate is so, although we are a huge global organization, uh, we also are very hyper-local, very embedded in our neighborhood. So the co kind of community-based programs at Tate were also putting pressure on us. And we're raising really, really important questions around race, equality, around access, all those issues that have been thrown to stark relief by COVID and also could underpin the need for those sustainability uh, goals and Agenda 2030. So making that de declaration was really important. And as I said, it was like crossing a line from passivity to action, uh, from kind of working underground, under the radar to full exposure. And uh, uh, you know, having taken that, we are full exposure is absolutely, we have to be held to account for everything that we do. And since that time, we've been much more exposed and criticized and held to account on social media, which is scary, but probably in the end, a very good thing. It, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a very open space for judgment and criticism. So the last two years alongside COVID, which has both been, uh, had a massive impact, complex impact, uh, on the whole context of uh, sustainability for Tate and uh, the cultural sector, um, it's been difficult navigating the kind of conjoined emergencies, but I just wanted to take you through some of the kind of um, play out, the impact of that declaration. One is that uh, across the whole organization, there's been a, a much more energized sense of working towards practical solutions for really grappling with the kind of deep, um, but more polluting aspects of our business. So taking responsibility. We've had a full audit of our, our, our carbon emissions from Julie's Bicycle in London, and that information has is real knowledge, a little bit like the way the science has helped us with dealing with COVID. Information around our processes, our buildings has helped us. We've switched to an entirely renewable uh, energy provider. We've reduced, almost eliminated single-use plastic. I mean, I know we're all doing these things. We're trialing circular economies. Uh, we've removed salmon from the menus in our shops. Um, and also then in delivering our programs. And the, here we have been massively helped by COVID. We have reduced our productivity by half. We've doubled the length that exhibitions are on the walls for. We've halved the number of works we've uh, uh, we loan, we've slowed down, we've intensified it, all that has actually had a huge impact on the experience of being in a museum. Um, we have been at the height of neoliberal growth and expansion for 20 years, and we all realise that it's got to stop. Um, so beyond those practical actions, when I say it's got to stop, I really mean it's got to stop. The model is broken. We know the model of industrial civilization is broken. We know the model of capitalism is broken. We know the power plays are broken. And the museum is inevitably a microcosm of all those things. So the model is broken. And you see that very starkly at Tate. Just to get, come back to the practical very quickly. We are uh, an institution that principally serves international tourists. And we do that because that is where our income comes from but 80% of our carbon footprint is also accounted for by their journeying. They come to see our big blockbuster exhibitions, which themselves account for a significant proportion of the remaining 20%. We're caught in this kind of extractive, consumptive model. At the same time, those exhibitions take energy and resource and imagination away from our wonderful permanent collection, our kind of circular economy, because it's always there, our work with our schools and our families, and our work in the community. So what is this doing for our ecosystem? It, the model is, is not working, and we absolutely now look to really need to look at serious systemic shift, and we've got to survive. So it's a, a kind of pivotal moment in our history. We recognize the problem, 
but in acting, in, in solving the problem, can we survive? And it comes down really to thinking about what, what the true value of art is. What is the true value? What does it really deliver to people? And what is its true cost? And they are not monetary equivalents. They are, they are about value in terms of education, in terms of access, in terms of learning, in terms of narratives. And those are the things that we need to treasure and nurture, and that if we're going to deliver them, we need deep and fundamental change. Within that, and we're a big museum, how can we use our very trusted position as a thought leader and a role model, not to influence, not to influence not just our audiences and our internal ways of things, but how can we lever that to challenge our political and, and economic leaders? Because we need big change, systemic change from a leadership position. We need it at grassroots, but we also need in any ecosystem, we may need to make the networks work for us. And can we, in what we do, demonstrate by our behaviours an alternative model to the growth model? There's huge cynicism about there, out there about whether museums can change. We have to change and we have to initiate it ourselves. Can we evolve as an organisation or organisations that put environmental and social responsibility at the heart of the business model, not outside it? So that really, I think I've probably got to the end of my time, that is where I am at the moment, that thinking about the wider understanding of value, thinking about the museum's core mission of access and inclusion, and fundamentally they are aligned to, with Agenda 2030 and those sustainability goals. Um, we we're asking big questions. George, you talked about the power of art. Helen, you talked about the power of embroidery. Of course, there are so many ways to tell a story and we need many ways for the huge public who need to come on board to understand our stories. Uh, and part of the true value in art is the value of the imagination, of storytelling, of narrative, of uh, engaging people in profoundly non-verbal but interactive ways, rethinking the past and envisaging the future. And I'm just gonna end uh, with a beautiful quote from Susan Hiller, great friend and brilliant artist who died just before COVID, but she described art as a locus where futures otherwise not possible can begin to shape themselves. And it's that otherwise not possible that speaks to me of the absolute importance to culture, of culture to sustainability. Amazing. Thank you so much, Francis. I think that's an incredibly powerful um, statement. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, I mean, one of the one of the really exciting parts about having such a diverse group here is that while we all have very different perspectives, there there seem to be many common threads. And I'm really excited about spending the next uh, 20 minutes or so exploring these with you. Um, I would like to also invite our audience. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat um, for any of our panelists, and we will we will go through those. Um, but I I wanted to kind of touch a little bit upon what what uh, Francis was talking about the models being broken and um, I don't know how everyone else reacted but when Zahida said that there were no layoffs at museums in Pakistan because of COVID I was very impressed by that and shocked and I think you know there's a lot of different elements that that we can discuss here in terms of learning from each other and I think that part of it is the economic models um, as Francis mentioned a lot of museums particularly in Europe and in North America are very reliant on this these very broken business models that kind of keep museums in a place of short-term thinking and survival mode and forcing layoffs, which perpetuates job insecurity, which perpetuates a lack of diversity in the field. And it's just all this big messy web. Um, but, and then of course, we have also talked a little bit about um, relevance in communities and, you know, some institutions are obviously doing it better than others and being able to, you know, move away from blockbuster exhibitions. And we'll get into all of that and the accountability as well. But what I was what I was interested in is um, something that Helen said about accountability, and this is um, 
a controversial perhaps topic, but one of the things that I've always been interested in is this concept of you know climate control. And in a lot of museums, people insist that climate control is absolutely essential and you know, or they say it's it's essential because of um, loan agreements or what it is. But I gave a presentation at an ICOM CC conference in 2017 where I was talking about lowering um, the the climate control restrictions in different institutions and someone came up to me afterwards and she said you know Caitlin we're already doing all the things that you say to do but it's because we only have access to energy three hours a day and she worked at a museum in Indonesia and so it's it's these ideas of you know financial models also maybe greener initiatives more engagement with community that we should actually be sharing and learning and I'd love to hear from the panel you know what how can we better work together? How can we share um, our experiences in order to come up with solutions that are gonna be more effective and, and, and yeah, help our institutions? Because it seems to me that people are doing really great things in different parts of the world, but we're not communicating it or sharing it in a way that's, that's, that's getting engagement on a global scale and as a sector unified. So I'd love to, I'd love to open up the floor to the panel to, uh, if there are any reactions, I don't know if anyone wants to, wants to take that first. No, no thoughts. George, maybe you have some uh, thoughts about that. Yeah, maybe I come in, but from a different angle. I wanted to give a few examples also from an institution that I am very much used to with that I also ran at some time back some years ago, which is the National Museums of Kenya. And I think the National Museums of Kenya has done a lot of good work. Of course, that doesn't mean that you know everything they touch has been a success, but I think they have made an uh, impact on, on human life. And I, I have a, um, the, the way, I, I'm a little bit reluctant to reduce everything to basically uh, uh, climate change, the whole sustainability to that, uh, because I think there is more to it than just climate change. And I think that we, we may, uh, which is a problem that we have had before, where we, we, we tend to, confine ourselves within a set structure of a box. And yet we don't have the language that those people who control that box have. And then at the end of the day, we, we probably lose out. I mean, just in summary, in what sustainability means, sustainable development goals, I mean, it says, what is the aim of sustainable development goals? And in short, the aim, as they say, is to end poverty protect the planet, which now brings climate change, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity now and the future. So there are about three elements there. And climate change, which is about environment, is one of them. And we know that environment, of course, touches on everything. And very quickly, I just want to mention some of the work that I think have been sustainable that the museum, as a museum in Kenya has done, and also in Tanzania and other parts of Africa, and very few, very little of this is known outside because museum is defined from the known so much. Uh, and it becomes something where people go and look at exhibition and then enjoy themselves and go back. But the African museum since the 1990s have been very proactive with communities. And two examples, two or three examples in areas that I think are crucial, but which we take for granted. One is in the area of knowledge systems. And um, of course, South America uh, is known for this. I think Helen mentioned quite some of that stuff. Knowledge systems, especially traditional knowledge systems, that a lot of that is disappearing. But if you look at the knowledge system of the past, they are extremely important in terms of food production and the types of food that we are doing, leave alone this uh, genetically modified food that we now have. In terms of medicinal plants, which have become what ecologists and other people have you know, exploited 
and turned into the medicines of the present that you go to the pharmacy and buy. In terms of peace and conflict resolution, and for example, the National Museums has been working on these knowledge systems in relation to some of those, where they are looking at issues of land, issues of food, and helping the communities to produce the traditional foods that sustain them and that were used as a buffer against hunger. Because hunger now comes because everybody has moved into these new crops that you know you, you, you have to depend so much on others to give you seeds. But people used to make their own seeds and people used to have particular crops that grew in particular areas. So this is an area that they have gone into. And, and they have, that for me is sustainability. Yeah. Uh, think, in terms of peace and conflict resolution, they have used the traditions of pastoralists. You know, pastoralists are always in very difficult environments. And because of those environments, there is always a possibility of conflict because people are fighting over the resources, uh, 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 the, 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 the resources that are always very scarce. Mm -hmm. For example, water, for example, pasture, and so on. And because of those experiences, they have developed mechanisms of reconciling and creating peace amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. When we talk about conflicts and peace now, when we talk about environment and climate change, climate change may actually introduce a lot of these problems that you have in desert and semi-desert areas. Mm -hmm. Now, one area in which we could be able to benefit from is from this knowledge of the pastoralists and the communities who have grown up and developed these systems of peace building. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the National Museums actually from the 1990s worked with the pastoralist, pastoralist communities to build this knowledge of peace building, which then is used even currently, so that it is not forgotten to try to bring peace among communities, especially when they are now faced with conflict arising out of climate change, which is bringing, you know, uh, challenges in terms of resources. And I think that for me is very powerful. The third and last example, I have many of these examples, but <laughs> I'm giving you examples that have been used by the museum here, is that the museum is also in charge of monuments, sites, and historic towns. And uh, one of the towns is listed as a World Heritage List, on the World Heritage List, which is Lamu. And then there is Mombasa. These are old towns where people are living and working and have created architectural phenomenon. But the knowledge of this creation was disappearing. And yet these places were listed as world heritage or as heritage places. In order for us to be able to sustain that, we had to actually train young people in the traditional knowledge systems of architecture or masonry of art. But it was done in such a way that they created a Swahili cultural center where they were also trained in business administration in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in proposal writing and also in funding fundraising. Mm -hmm. And to cut the story short, some of the people who were trained in the 1990s and 2000s now own their own shops, produce their own produce and run their own businesses. And they are the ones who are now maintaining these old houses and towns and landscapes because they have that knowledge which was then gifted to them by not the museum itself, by the traditional knowledge bearers who for years have done this through passing it over generation to generation. But the lead agency was the museum. So the museums can do lots of other things. And I think when we talk about sustainability, it's about making sure that what you have can be able to be passed over even in a better way and that it meets the needs of the present generation. That for us is sustainability. And, and so I think that environment, you can only talk environment when you have people who can feed themselves. 
You can only talk environment when you have people who are, are aware of the problems. You can only talk environment when you have a people who are free to express themselves and you create spaces for expression. Yeah. The museums provide those particular spaces to do those things. And it has worked in Africa, and I think it can work everywhere else. It's not yeah. just a place where you go to, you know, enjoy Van Gogh and then, uh, you know, Picasso stuff, and then after that you leave. But as, as, as Francis has mentioned, you can do it in, 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 in England, you can do it in Europe. And what they are doing is very similar to what we are doing here, which is practically applying to communities and to people and to the institution. It's creating a change and transformation. That's absolutely, absolutely amazing, George. Thank you so much. And I, this is exactly why I wanted to on this panel, because I think that there are such powerful examples. And I also really love what you were saying about, um, you know, incorporating indigenous or traditional knowledge. And that was something that um, Helen had also touched upon um, in, in, in her presentation. Um, I know that uh, Frances had, uh, had uh, indicated that she would like to maybe get, have a reaction. You know, I was so take, I've been so carried away by George's narrative that I can't really remember what the <laughs> question was about. But I mean, I would, I think it, George is absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the role that museums can have in that broader sense of create, of the environmental, which is about changing people's lives and providing with access and, 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 and being part of the ecosystem is, is, is it, it, it's not about where in the world you are, it's about what kind of organization you are. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, it's really important that, that at, the, at the bottom of what, the heart of what we do is putting people in touch with each other and with a sense of renewal in their lives. And I, this afternoon, just before I came um, onto the Zoom, I just had a really wonderful five minutes outside in our landscape helping two artists who are act climate activist artists install a hundred very, very small oak trees, which they have grown from tiny oaks taken from Joseph Boyce's great installation in Castle, which I think dates from the 1970s. And it's a kind of gesture of renewal and hope. And Joseph Boyce, activist artist, hugely, um, significant international, internationally, a founder of the German uh, Green Party and connecting this younger generation to that earlier generation and the public within them to show the power of what you can do from a little oak, for me is incredibly important. So the, how you connect these micro stories that touch people's lives and how they participate is, and connecting that with the the dry science and the facts and the stuff around decarbonization is the most important thing that we can do. We live it, we can live it and help yeah. other people live it. I love that. And that's exactly the power of culture. And I think, um, you know, this, this, this string that we're resonating with here <clears throat> about connectivity through culture, but also um, on the different levels, you know, we've talked a little bit about kind of grassroots, we've talked about policy, and we've talked about global and working together. Um, I did have a comment from one of our audience members, and I'd actually love to pass the mic over to her for just about one minute, to talk about her work in this area, and then I'd like to uh, swing over to Helen. Um, but Johanna, if you uh, have, would like to, Alessandra, if you can unmute Johanna for just one minute, go ahead. I'm on mute, I believe. Yes, hi, thank you so much, Caitlin, and congratulations to putting this panel together because it, it, it really brings it all to life in a coercive way. Um, I call myself a cross-pollinator, working between the worlds of diplomacy, corporate, and arts and culture. And Francis, so glad that you mentioned about Joseph Boyce. I've been living in Castle for a year and just came back. Um, what I can help with is uh, particularly in the work that we're doing, even though we believe we're global these days, you need people that are building those relationships with the policymakers because they find it very alienating to come to the art world 
And also you have in the art world initiatives like this that need to be put out there to, 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 to the people that have the power to make legislation as well as the people that have the resources. And I'm very happy to bridge that. I've worked with the Queen producing reports, the G20 reports, and I've also been working with the World Economic Forum um, over the past few years. So very happy yeah. to connect that. Amazing, yeah, and I think that that's one of the one of the uh, themes, you know, in, in terms of how not only we can advocate as cultural um, institutions within our communities and within our audiences, but also on policy level and how we can influence that top down approach as well. Um, one of the things that um, that George was talking about that I, I mentioned was very much resonating with me was this idea of connecting with ancient traditions and indigenous communities and um, and also what Francis was saying about accountability and I'd love to this is something that Helen had talked about so I'd love to pass it over to Helen now um, for her her thoughts on this on this topic so Helen the floor is yours. Thanks Caitlin. Um, I, I think there were two points that I um, that that struck me uh, during this conversation, and I the first was when um, Francis was talking about um, accountability and the the role of the museum as acting as kind of a, a protector for artists who are on the front line, and I think that's a really important role that museums can take, um, especially in a region like. Um, Central and South America, but also in Africa and Southeast Asia, where um, protections for environmental defenders and advocates are really lax, and it's actually really dangerous um, to be an environmental defender in these regions. And we have the unfortunate distinction of being, um, I think, the region that is most dangerous for environmental defenders. So I think um, that the museums in this role, I think, could be. Um, potentially a good way to kind of act as maybe perhaps a buffer in providing a name and perhaps bringing um, more light, shedding more light to this issue, which is a really, really important issue to us. Um, and then I think the second point relating to accountability and um, environmental and, and, and traditional knowledge, um, which I think is really important, a really important role that museums can take is, is also um, kind of acknowledging the colonialist history that some museums have had um, and the colonialist role that some museums have had. Um, and when we talk about uh, indigenous knowledge, um, I think it's often uh, taken out of context and sometimes um, used in an extractivist way where researchers come into a community, they extract their knowledge and then they take it and the community who originally had the, the knowledge or, or the resources never really gets any benefit. So I think that that's a real, another really important way that um, perhaps museums, um, I don't know, might broker this relationship um, and, and ensure that communities aren't only being extracted from, but also on the receiving end and protected as well. Yeah, and that's, that's such an important fact, what you're saying about the reciprocity and the mutually beneficial, beneficial relationship. And I think that's one of the um, really uh, powerful aspects of cultural institutions as buildings and as physical places is that idea that we can invite in our, our audiences and our um, and conversations and create space, safe spaces for dialogue. And this is very much what George was talking about at the beginning about, you know, museums and cultural institutions offer a place to have what could be seen as confrontational conversations. And we have the capacity to talk about these issues in a way that is not confrontational, but that is um, that is uh, empathetic. And I think that that's, that's a really interesting, interesting point. Um, this actually kind of segues really nicely into a question we received in the chat um, from a guest who's joining us from Canada. And she said, uh, in Canada, environmentalism is often perceived as div divisive, a political issue. And she's curious how to know how the panelist institutions navigate the political conversations that often accompany discussions about sustainability. And I would actually really love to hear from Zahida on this, if, um, if you would mind taking, taking this one. 
Yes, um, interestingly, we have really have a good control on this because um, before that uh, we have uh, problems uh, of uh, political issues because in Pakistan have a multicultural, uh, you know, country. Each of its ex province has a different uh, ethnicity, and we have ethnic ethnic problem on its peak here, uh, which uh, which is also a kind of um, a major issue, a major you know backbone of conflicts uh, arising in Pakistan. But in uh, 2011, what happened that uh, the all power of uh, uh, you know taking uh, taking power or uh, uh, I mean um, this move to the provinces. Before that, uh, the power of uh, taking decisions uh, regarding uh, policies making or whatever it was uh, at federal level. So it was really a tension between provinces that who will take the control and uh, the ruling party has all the rights to make the decisions but after 18 amendment in 2011 uh, the power has been transferred to the each provinces so now each province is uh, free has a freedom to take uh, to make policies to take decisions and uh, interestingly each province has its own political party so there's no clash on it uh, have we all have our own cultural policies we have on uh, our uh, you know museums uh, which is the not uh, uh, you know, bound to federal government or any other province uh, uh, who can interfere in our any policy or any government, uh, any museum, you know, strategy. We are free to develop, uh, every province is free to develop its own policy. They are free to develop their own, you know, uh, heritage trails or whatever. Like I have mentioned that uh, uh, we are making a heritage trail. So this is made basically made in uh, the northern Pakistan. I'm from the lower parts in southern Pakistan. So uh, the heritage trail was uh, basically made over there. And now with the collaboration of two provinces, uh, we are, you know, making a Gandhara trail from northern Pakistan to the southern Pakistan. And it is in process. So uh, in this way, we really have a good control on this political tension regarding policies on sustainability and everything. So uh, we, we really are free from all these political tensions. That's that's quite amazing to hear, and it's really it's really um, yeah it's it's something that you in some parts of the world is really a huge issue, and in other parts of the world it's they they've seemed to got a control on it. So that's that's really amazing. Um, I don't know if any other panelists wanted to weigh on on this particular question before we wrap up. I know that we're a little over time. Yeah, Francis, please. I, I suppose just a, a slightly different issue here is that. Um, I think we, we're as an arms length governmental organization, it's very difficult for us to, uh, the perception that we might take a political position can put in, us in a very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. So we tread a tightrope in um, how we communicate and how we perform as activists in this field. And the relationship with artists is incredibly important. When a recent activist group arrived at the Turbine Hall, we hope we welcome them. You know, we have to be very careful about which, which, which words we use. And, and so far that, that has been very effective, but I'm very aware that it is an act of diplomacy and continuous negotiation. Mm -hmm. Because if we lose, you know, we need, we need to sit between the two. We need to negotiate that space um, uh, actively rather than lose our public standing or lose the trust of our public. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank Let, you. Let me just say one thing. You know, the, the first and probably the only environmentalist who has got a who got a, a Nobel Peace Prize was from Kenya, Wangari mm. Madai. Uh, she had to undergo a lot of pressure, you know, from government and business. And so I understand what the colleague from Canada is saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the problem is that the government and the private sector expect uh, activism from environmentalists. Uh, because either you keep quiet and they go overboard, or you say something and you are taken as, you know, being a protester. And uh, I, I think there is need for a balance. For me, and this is why I'm saying the museums are privileged institutions and positions. You can tell different stories. You can tell many stories. 
museums act as agoras, as places of dialogue and discussion. And some of these things, you don't have to uh, directly address them, but by giving those spaces to those voices, they may be different. You let the people now decide and you use the museum as a place where people can have those different voices. And I've seen museums that do provide those spaces for those particular different voices and let the community decide. I was reading, I think it was today or yesterday's uh, art newsletter. I think there's a museum, I don't know exactly where, but it's getting a lot of banging for accepting money from a shell company, which is an oil company. Uh, I don't know what other colleagues would say, but if they are getting the money and Shell is going to correct the mistakes or Shell is not putting anything, they can criticize Shell. I think that probably they can use that money to change that Shell. So it's a difficult situation, but I think that for me, museums are places for, for dialogue. And if there are places for dialogue, they can provide those voices, even if those voices are not coming together, but they, they, they act as places for people to come and judge for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that we can play that role as, as museums without necessarily taking a one particular position. And for me, that is the privilege. We can take positions and we do take positions, positions for the, to, for the better world, for good things. But we can also actually uh, sort of openly open up those wounds and let communities and people see for themselves the damages that are being done and being hidden by those who do that, whether it's government or business community. Amazing. Thank you so much, George. I think that's a really, really powerful um, sentiment. And I know that we're over time here. So I'd love to I'd love to wrap up. And um, actually, what I'd like to do is is to just ask uh, for a final thought from each of our panelists. Um, if you could give one piece of advice or one tip for a practical solution for how we can start moving towards a sustainable future as cultural sector, what would it be? And um, I'd love to start with Helen if she's doesn't mind me putting her on the spot. Helen, what do you think? Sure. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is um, the importance of museums um, as a space of, for dialogue, but also um, as an inclusive space and a space where um, perhaps voices that have been underprivileged or voices that have been um, smothered uh, can also come uh, to light and participate in these important discussions. Amazing. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Zahida, would you like to go next? Uh, yes. Um, uh, well, uh, in, I was speaking uh, in context of my country. Uh, seriously, museums in Pakistan have a great potential to create uh, uh, job opportunities for many of the people because uh, uh, we are facing economic crisis so much. And uh, uh, we think that uh, basically the government think that the museums are just for, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it is a place to uh, display archaeological artifacts or some uh, cultural objects. No, basically, museum uh, has a multiple kind of uh, uh, you know opportunities for everyone. Like uh, I have uh, just uh, uh, quickly, I add um, that um, one of our heritage site, world heritage site of Makli, uh, has a a beggar community, a huge beggar community over there. So due to uh, after we have initiated some projects, that's another thing we have initiated the project and try to engage them uh, in some kind of heritage related activities. We find uh, we uh, uh, you know involve them in conservation uh, and work and everything. And now few of them are not, uh, that much trained that they are um, supposed to be guide in the museum. And they are 20 to 30 girls uh, who will be uh, museum, museum guide in coming, uh, you know, maybe coming uh, six months quarterly we are still working on it so for me 
museum is a great place to create job opportunities for uh, very uh, you know marginalized communities um, and uh, even for the people who don't have uh, uh, you know employment so please do engage museums in policy making while you make uh, policies for uh, you know sustainable development or for anything i it's just a piece of advice for my own government don't underestimate museum please amazing thank you so much francis Oh, you're still on mute. I think there we are. I suppose on a personal basis, after an or after a long career that has been spent thinking about the past and kind of rewriting the narratives of the past, bringing gender parity, transnational to replace the kind of Western modernism, I think we have to think about the future. And I would like to see museums making a kind of fundamental shift away from tangible heritage towards the intangible possibility of the future. I think that's, yeah, we need to dream about the future and make it happen. I love that. It's really beautiful. And George, would you like to round us off? Yes, thank you very much. I think that there are about three or four things that I think the museum project, if I can call museum a project, uh, museum should do uh, to finish the process of decolonization, to finish the process of demystifying itself, to finish the process of mind change, which I think Francis did mention earlier on, so that we can have a total paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, then my sentence, my word would be that the museums should not do it for others, but they should do it with others. Because if you do it for me, you're against me. If you do it with me, we are together. I love that, amazing. We do it with each other, we are together. That's a beautiful, uh, beautiful way to finish off this incredibly inspirational conversation. And I have been looking forward to this for quite some time and I'm just, so grateful for our panelists joining us today and for all of their time and insights and all the incredible work that they do. So I'd love to uh, thank you all for, for listening and thank our panelists for participating today. Um, as the ICOM Working Group of Sustainability, we certainly hope to be bringing you more uh, insightful discussions such as the one we've had today. And we would love to welcome um, comments, feedback, and ideas. We want to start engaging more with the ICOM community. So please do let us know, reach out to us, do let us know how we can help you, um, what you'd like to see from us as the working group. And we will be uh, in more frequent communication uh, upcoming. So we're really looking forward to continuing to work together to uh, position ICOM as leaders for this sustainable future that we're working towards together. So thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope that you uh, had as good of a time as I did and very much looking forward to uh, speaking with you all soon and seeing you as we continue our sustainability journey together and happy Earth Day. <laughs>